The FBI is really an extra constitutional agency. It, its origins were sort of a ask for forgiveness, not permission in Congress backdated legislation to support this Bureau of Investigation. And if you look at the history of the FBI, it's never really been about protecting the Constitution. It's been about preserving status quo for whoever is in charge, whatever they deem to be what their desired outcome. And the Venn diagram may overlap with constitutional republicanism. So the FBI went after communists in the in the 40s and the 50s, and I think people would think that that was an objectively good thing. But when the status quo that of the, the rulers did not like what Martin Luther King was doing, the FBI went after him with COINTELPRO. This isn't recent. This is something that people on the political left have been saying for decades. And now, because at the time you would say that's the Bush administration, they were going after perceived terrorists from radical Islam. Well, now your administration, by his words, himself by the president of the United States last September 1st in front of Independence Hall. He said that Republicans are anti-government extremism and white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Those are two of the top four priorities of the counterterrorism division of the FBI. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by Nick Solheim, the COO of American Moment. Rare double feature. You have both Nick and I for what was a fantastic episode with Steve Friend. More on him in a second. As always, be sure to go to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find everything we have cooking, our programming, the backlog of this podcast. You can go to AmericanMoment.org slash join, fill out the form, and we'll meet with you to figure out how to get you involved in DC. You might be habituated into thinking, oh, American Moment only has programming in the summer. Uh, and that was true. Uh, but I think it's not going to be true for much longer. So keep on going to the website. You might be seeing that we're starting to run more and more stuff year round. Today, we were very glad to have on uh, a fantastic, a truly brave person, Steve Friend, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Winning America. He's an opinion writer, author, and former state and federal law enforcement officer with more than a decade of experience. He worked as a patrolman and narcotics agent in Savannah, Georgia, before joining the Federal Bureau of Investigation in 2014. Steve investigated violent crimes and major offenses occurring on Indian reservations in Northeast Nebraska for seven years and was also a member of the FBI Omaha SWAT team. He transferred to Daytona Beach, Florida to investigate child exploitation and human trafficking before being reassigned to investigate domestic terrorism. Steve became an FBI whistleblower in 2022 after making protected disclosures to Congress about the FBI's questionable and manipulative investigations of January 6th protesters. He's the author of True Blue, My Journey from Beat Cop to FBI Whistleblower, and a 2007 graduate of the University of Notre Dame, holds a bachelor's in science and accounting, and is a married father of two sons. Um, we had a fantastic conversation with Steve talking about everything wrong with the FBI, um, how it works. Uh, you know, Many of you might not be aware of sort of the details of how these different offices work, what the relationship between state and local and federal law enforcement is. He goes into all of that. And then most importantly, the circumstances that led him to decide to become one of what are ultimately very few whistleblowers who speak out when government agencies are doing the wrong thing. I thought it was just a gripping conversation and, and and an incredibly gripping story. What did you think about it, Nick? This is a recurring theme with all of our podcast episodes. Uh, I never realized how bad it is <laughs> until we sit down and talk with somebody who has experience. Um, this is a great episode. Uh, the FBI is terrible. Uh, <laughs> the, the I mean, he has some very interesting proposals for how we could uh, reform it in the case that we're not able to destroy it. We talked about that kind of in the last uh, quarter of the episode. So uh, make sure to stay tuned in. But yeah, fantastic show. We'll go now to Steve Friend. Sir, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. We always like to hear about how our guests got to the point where they are today. And few have as explosive a story of why suddenly a lot of people in DC know their name. Tell us how you got started with the FBI and what the early days of your career were like before things went a little bit haywire. 
Well, I'm from Savannah, Georgia, and I was a police officer there for a number of years before I decided to apply to the FBI. And that's sort of the, the NFL of law enforcement. I wanted to, to go to the highest level possible. And because of my background in law enforcement and I have an education in accounting, that made me a more desirable candidate. And I joined the FBI in 2014. And because of my law enforcement background, they sent me to the Midwest in Sioux City, Iowa, to work on Indian reservations. And that's a very niche area within the FBI. There's only about 150 agents that do it. And it gives you tremendous access to the the volume of casework that you need to actually become a competent agent. I had done law enforcement for a number of years, but as far as being a, an investigator, I didn't have the repetitions necessarily that I, I feel like uh, that I have now that makes me more, uh, certainly more competent as, a, as an agent. And I opened about 200 cases in about seven years, arrested 150 violent criminals. And that was important to me because it impacted these small communities and really gave them assistance because it's a, it's a strange special jurisdiction that exists on Indian reservations that most people aren't familiar with. They're technically sovereign nations and they have their own criminal justice system, their own tribal police, but because of retrocession where essentially they came back under the federal government of the United States quasi uh, sovereignty, they are unable to charge felonies on many abhorrent crimes. So I've seen people charged with rape and get 40 days in jail. And these are extremely vulnerable small communities. So I was able to help those, those departments out when they only had a single digit number of police officers and were just there's rampant alcoholism and drug abuse and sexual abuse. And uh, I always felt that as an FBI agent, your prime directive is to assist local law enforcement in doing their job because those are the guys that know where the resources need to go. They know where the usual suspects are. They're great for intelligence purposes. They're great for just performing the, the needs of the community. And uh, so I did that for about seven years. And because- Just a question on that. How does, how does that process work where you're assigned to a, a specific community? And when you say that you, you know, had 200 cases in, in seven years, you know, how, how does a case get originated is, I guess, what I'm asking, you know, do are you just out in the community looking for trouble or how does that exactly work? Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of uh, latitude as far as how you want to, to take on cases. And it depends on where your where your violation of the, your your job description sort of entails. So for me, I was assigned to work violent crimes, major offenses that happened on these Indian reservations. Now, I wasn't a first responder, so I wasn't patrolling. Uh, what I would typically do every day was drive out to these reservations, talk to the guys who were working on the street. They worked night shift, day shift, I, and they would flow back and forth between the two and figure out what had happened the prior evening or it happened over the weekend and look through their incident reports very much like a violent crimes detective would for an ordinary police department because they didn't have an investigator. And I would look at the, the the crimes and as I became more familiar with the typical federal system, what what it will take and what it will not and the, the sort of prerequisite uh, violations that, that they look to to charge, I would know better if it was something that I could take federally. And if I, if I thought I was borderline, I could call the U.S. Attorney's Office up and feel like it was a good relationship with them that I could prosecute crimes. So can you talk about where the FBI in its best situation is able to help local law enforcement um, and actually provide the the aid um, that they're theoretically supposed to? Like, how does that relationship work? What is it that local law enforcement cannot do that the FBI can? Well, local law enforcement, they have state arrest authority. So if there's actually a federal crime, then it's very rare that a federal prosecutor will take uh, a pr proposal for pro federal prosecution from a state agency. Um, so the FBI comes in to fill that gap. And there's also expertise. There's tremendous amount of resources and tools that your local agencies just don't have. Um, and they would come to us sometimes for just simple analysis of, of evidence that they just didn't have the ability to do. And then you'd open up a, a simple liaison case so you could send their evidence to the lab and in Quantico, Virginia, the FBI lab to do any sort of analysis they wanted because their department didn't have that resource available. And that's that's why the FBI exists for, for, for that purpose, for the liaison purposes. And then 
when it comes to the Indian reservations, they cannot charge certain crimes that might occur legally. So if, if a non-Native American commits a crime on a reservation, their tribal police cannot arrest that individual. So the FBI has to come in and fill that. So I've had situations where I was actually driving, crossed over the line, saw some blue light flashing. I thought there maybe was a traffic accident, rolled up to make sure everything was okay. And the police officers there were just, oh, thank goodness you're here. We have a non-Native American who just committed an assault. We can't arrest him. Can you grab him for us? And I had to charge him with a simple assault, a, a misdemeanor crime, but they could only temporarily detain him or they were going to have to let him walk away. Right? So there's, there's these weird jurisdictional rules that you have to follow. Um, and it's very valuable, I think, for an investigator because you get a huge volume of cases. You're considered fully assigned if you have 25 cases. I typically had more than that, 30 to 40 at a time. And you also get a lot of access or opportunities to go to trial. For me, I went to trial eight times in seven years. Many FBI agents never go to trial. So I was... And is that because in a lot of cases, people take a, a plea deal or... or what other reasons? Yeah, it's it's something around 96 or 97% of cases in the federal system are, are pled out. And then there's uh, there's also a uh, there's a tendency to, to go to to trial more in, in tribal just statistically I just they, they they will go to trial more often and as a result of that I, I got very familiar with the pitfalls that you can run into if you even have a you think it's a slam dunk case you have to work really well with your federal prosecutors. You get an opportunity to testify a lot in front of grand juries and then in front of actual juries, criminal juries, and you get cross-examined by defense attorneys and you know how you have to be really buttoned up in your cases because I've lost cases where I had DNA evidence and confessions and still lost at a jury trial. So it, hmm. it sort of instilled in me this need to be as buttoned up as possible. How successful uh, do you think this system is, the kind of collaboration specifically between, uh, you know, police departments on reservations and, uh, you know, federal agencies? I mean, it seems to me that there might be, you know, a bit of a rub there where like more people might be getting away with stuff uh, as opposed to just your run of the mill police department. It depends a lot on the personalities of the agents involved. I... Uh, I would always laugh because I would go to meet with a local department or sheriff's office or something to that effect. And it seemed to me that they were always trying to give me their federal bona fides and say, oh, I was looking at becoming a task force officer. And I was always trying to give them my local bona fides and say, well, I, I was the real police at one point. And uh, having seen both sides of that fence, I, I realized that there's far superior policing skills at a local level. And mm. many FBI agents don't even work criminal violations. They work at the national security space. So you can go an entire career, 20 years in the FBI, never put handcuffs on anybody because you're working in counterintelligence matters or counterterrorism matters and, and you just never have that opportunity. So the the pop culture idea of what the FBI does, is it not, it's not a full picture of what the FBI actually represents. And as a result of that, the the locals, I think, to, again, it's back to the personality issue. If if you go to them hat in hand and say, I want to work with you, um, there's initially some skepticism, I think, because there's a lot of that Agent Johnson, Agent Johnson from Die Hard, no, no relation. Uh, and the FBI has a reputation of swooping in and stealing the, the good cases and then not following through on their promises. And I always just made it my mission to get to yes. That was, I said, whatever I can do, I will... I will exhaust every possible effort to say yes to you, to give you what you need to do your job. Well, you said good cases there, and I know that's probably a tongue in cheek term, but but what does that exactly mean? Because I think the the sociology of law enforcement, like in so many things, explains a lot of what goes on. Like you mentioned earlier that the the, the coolest thing to be is an FBI agent. Like that's what a lot of cops want to end up doing. Um, but but what is it, a good case and how does the FBI take a good case? Like how does that how does that work? Yeah. I, I, uh... I think again, we're back to what do, what do you view as a good case? To me, it's it's a, a case where I can put a person in jail who did something bad. But I think the FBI views a good case as something that involves an organization, 
and it could be uh, organized crime, it could be drugs. It's also tied to funding. So the FBI, because it has this system that I'm sure we'll get into, which is essentially a quota system, will always look for opportunities to get cases that it deems to be good because it presents a lot of subjects that they can charge and claim that they've arrested multiple people. And it's uh, it's lucrative for them to to get the funding that they need to justify the funding that they have. And if you can have the opportunity to open up an organized crime drug enforcement task force, OSADEF case, it's basically unlimited funds that are at your fingertips to, to bring a case forward. And a lot of times those are drug investigations and uh, it'll start with the local uh, department that'll say, hey, we have this, this corner house here. We know they're selling meth and it just is outside of our ability to work up the chain. So we're going to bring this to the FBI and then the FBI has the resources and the manpower to move up to the mid-level dealer and then move up to the next level. And then eventually you're looking at a cartel. So I think that would be like a good case. It's outside of your more violent crimes, something that's financial in nature, the, and that depends geographically, but most U.S. attorney's offices won't take a case if it's under a million dollars. So you have cases like in Chicago, if it's a $900,000 fraud scheme, prosecutor federally will not take that case. So it's it's always contingent on uh, what you know where you live and what, what they deem to be worthy of, of looking into because there's just there's more crime out there than than police and prosecutors to handle and sometimes you just have to throw them back. So you spent 7 years in in Sioux City. Um, is that a typical length of time for an agent to be assigned to their first location and then and then what did you do next well because i worked on indian reservations you get an exit benefit that's they try to entice agents to do that work there's always a shortage of agents willing to do it i happened to get assigned to it it wasn't a choice of mine i would have because i enjoyed the work but because of of that working that violation it entitled me to an exit benefit and it allowed me to to relocate where i wanted to go sort of steer where that was going to go, put me to the front of the line on transfers. So my wife and I looked at what was available. We were from Georgia. We wanted to get somewhere closer to our family. And the opportunity presented itself to transfer to Daytona Beach, Florida, which is a resident agency. It's a satellite office for the Jacksonville field office. And we took that, talked to the boss there, and he explained to me that there was an opening to work on child pornography and human trafficking cases. So I accepted that transfer in the summer of 2021. And talk to me about that particular specialty within the FBI. It's, it's, I mean, I assume it's one of the most sensitive levels of, of, of case uh, load that someone can get. What is, how does it measure up against the different kinds of things that agents do? Uh, surprisingly, it is one of the lowest priorities in the FBI. Really? And it, that's very disappointing. I think, uh, I think you can, cause they draw all of their public aplomb from doing stuff like that. Y yes and no. I, I think the FBI views its, its media, uh, big media moments as being the big pile of money and guns and drugs on the table. And I think that there's just this natural human recoil to the idea of child pornography. And we, we all just kind of want to pretend it doesn't exist. It is unique because it's digital and there's not really a geographical threat that's more prominent in one area versus another. If you're in El Paso, there's obviously going to be border related crime more so than in Milwaukee. But child pornography is rampant and nationwide. It's understaffed and it's one of the two violations. The two major violations that I had the opportunity to work in the FBI, Indian reservations and child pornography are the two that you can sort of beg out of. You can say, look, I, I just can't handle the work. I need to be reassigned and they will try to accommodate that. So for, for me, when I arrived at Daytona Beach, it was one one person who was on paper supposed to be assigned to work in that violation. And the boss even gave me an out when I arrived. He said, look, you just have to work a couple of these cases. You can do other things if you want. And I said, look, if it's a righteous violation, I'll, I'll work it 100% of my time. And you could just see this relief on his face. <laughs> and he said, I'll have everybody in the office give you their cases because it freed them up to not have to do it. And th there was a squad of agents that worked in Jacksonville, but I was just a one man show down in Daytona. And the two agents that had preceded me there to work that violation, 
they'd only been there for a short amount of time. And I think that the local sheriff's office had been sort of let down because of that. They're just, by the time you develop a relationship, they were gone. So I had to go and redevelop those relationships very much the way I did with the travel police, which took some time and make them promises and say, look, I, I, at that point I'd been in the FBI for seven years, said, I've got another decade and a half that I'm going to be here and I have no intention of transferring or promoting or anything like that. I'm content to be here. And if you will show me how to work these cases, because I didn't have a, a mentor available to learn, I was going to have to learn from the the local guys who were had been experienced in doing it and were competent at it. And they were just fantastic. They, they gave me a computer. They gave me a workspace. They were inviting me on their local uh, search warrants and arrest warrants so I could get repetitions at it and get competent at it. And then I was able to help them and bring cases federal that were maybe going to be outside of what their ability to, to handle were. So it was a great relationship with them that was unfortunately cut short and uh, in the fall of 2021. So a few months after I arrived, the new fiscal year rolled around and I was told that I was reassigned to work on domestic terrorism in my office as a member of the Joint Terrorism Task Force and that child pornography was a local matter and we weren't going to be addressing it going forward. And when the FBI had terrorism in mind, what was the kind of cases that they were assigning you to? Well, the, the JTTF has had four members at that point with me, two agents and two task force officers. And the other agent- What's was, the distinction between an agent and a task force officer? Uh, an agent is a FBI employee, 1811, criminal investigator, special agent. A task force officer in our, is a state law enforcement officer. So in our case, there was a deputy and then there was a police detective from different agencies and they got deputized by the U.S. Marshals as federal agents. So they had state and federal arrest authority and local knowledge. So they're supposed to augment this task force. Okay. And I was supposed to be the, the domestic terrorism guy and the other agent was the international terrorism guy. And it was pretty apparent and clear once I got moved over because I didn't know what I didn't know. And I just said, look, if that's where they need me to go, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, there just wasn't a volume of cases available. There was There's special events in Daytona Beach that require special security. You have a NASCAR races and, that, and those sort of events. And there's a history of of uh, outlaw motorcycle gangs, but that's not really a terrorism issue. That's more of a, a gang issue. And it was just clear that there, there were January 6th cases that were sitting dormant in our office because at that point it was nine, 10 months had elapsed since the incident. And those referrals had already been sent to our office from Washington. And the guys there had done the interviews and uh, the, the necessary investigations that they were tasked with doing and we were just sitting on these cases waiting for Washington field office, the task force to tell us what to do. And, and when I dug into that, because I was, that's not consistent with FBI rules. Uh, and that, that disturbed me because I was worried that we were doing things in, in we were departing from the FBI rules. And to be clear, the, the reason sitting on that case is relevant is because those people were already in jail. No. Okay. Those were people who had been identified by, by facial recognition or tips or GPS, all this analysis that was done in Washington. And then they would send it to the location where that person was expected to live. And they said, you open the case. It's your case. We'll just tell you what to do on it. I see. So they were outsourcing the responsibility of actually bringing these cases to the local field offices to make it seem more organic. That's my contention. Now, yeah. now, you're allowed to, the FBI rulebook says, if the person lives in a certain area, that that office can open the case. Now, January 6th is very unique. It's, it's a one incident happened in Washington, DC. And you would typically see one case opened up with however many subjects are gonna be investigated. And if they lived in Daytona, then the Washington agents that were assigned to that case would task the guys in Daytona with doing things for their case. But it wouldn't be assigned to Daytona because that's what the crime occurred in Washington, DC. But the decision was made that they were gonna open up separate cases for every single person as opposed to just one case. So now we've created thousands of cases and then we're mm -hmm. gonna open them up in the area where they lived, which is allowable, but it's very unusual. And it to me, it's, it's just inauthentic because 
you're considering them a domestic terrorist, it, they're not plotting an attack in Daytona Beach. They're a person who's accused of essentially riot or trespassing for most of these cases. It's not an ongoing concern. It's whether or not they committed this crime in the past. But once you assign that case to me in Daytona or any other person, any other city, that responsibility for bringing that case forward, the investigation falls to that agent or that task force officer to do what they seem fit. That wasn't what was happening. We were taking orders from Washington on how to do our own cases. And that to me, having gone to trial is a problem. If you depart from the rules in the FBI, you have to say why you're doing it. You have to document it. And I, I, it just didn't make sense to me because you could easily open the case up in Washington. Why are we going to depart from our rules and set ourselves up to look bad at trial? If you use the wrong color evidence tape, that's a departure from the FBI rules. A defense attorney can say, agent, is it true that you use the wrong color evidence tape? What other departures did you have that just create reasonable doubt? And my concern was if we have a righteous case where somebody needs to be prosecuted for committing a, a federal violation of law, we might lose because we're not even justifying why we did this very unusual thing that was achieving the result we could have done, but operating outside the rules. And I asked the guys that had been there the whole time because I was late to the game. And uh, I was told that they raised those concerns and um, in the aftermath of January 6th, and they were told by high ranking people on nationwide calls that were going out that this was to get buy-in, which is not a term I'm very familiar with. I've never heard that. But if you're familiar- yeah, What do they mean by? Well, they, I could only rationally conclude two things. One, they, they don't think that their workforce is going to work hard unless their name is on it, which is a pretty macabre view of your personnel. Or secondly, which I believe is more likely, is that because they opened up separate cases and because they spread them around the field, they allowed all the field offices to hit their quotas for domestic terrorism stats. Hmm. And this is a program that's called Integrated Program Management, IPM. It's a quota system that exists in the FBI. And it is annually uh, constructed through field office strategic planning and threat review prioritization, very McKinsey consulting speak. And they negotiate essentially from the field offices and headquarters what their numbers are going to be, who they're expected numbers to open up cases, arrest individuals, tools they must use. And it is tied to the bonuses for all the senior executives that run the field offices. And they get bonuses between 30 and $50,000 because their subordinates arrest the correct number of people. And as a result of that, it creates an inverse incentive structure in the FBI to work smarter and not harder because whatever you ask for, you will get more of it. So why would I open up one case when I can open up thousand cases and then spread them around so we look like we have domestic terrorism around the country Everybody gets paid. We have a political talking point and uh, we now have an enhanced budget because we can go to Congress and say that. So in, a, in addition to the like financial considerations, you know, I think the right term for this would be like kickbacks basically for arresting the right amount of people. Um, what are some of the, you know, political issues at play with the kind of delayed timeline with kind of venue selection, you know, uh, basically prosecuting these people all over the country. Um, do they get more press out of it that way? Like, tell us more about the politics of the whole thing. It's inefficient because they're only being charged in Washington, D.C. The, the, the venue for the crime is in Washington, D.C. And they have this task force that is giving marching orders around. Uh, but it's taking a long time because there's only so many people that can work at a time. There's only so many judges and they're not charging if the person lives in Daytona, they're not taking it to the middle district of Florida because the crime allegedly occurred in Washington, DC. I think there's, there's a political element to it uh, because the FBI, you could make the case and I will make the case that the FBI is really an extra constitutional agency. It Its origins were sort of a, ask for forgiveness, not permission in, in Congress, backdated legislation to support this Bureau of Investigation. And if you look at the history of the FBI, it's never really been about protecting the Constitution. It's been about preserving status quo. 
for whoever is in charge, whatever they deem to be what their desired outcome. And the Venn diagram may overlap with constitutional republicanism. So the FBI went after communists in the in the 40s and the 50s, and I think people would think that that was an objectively good thing. But when the status quo that of the the rulers did not like what Martin Luther King was doing, the FBI went after him with COINTELPRO. And you combine that with this quota system, and you combine those two with this mission creep that has set in since September 11th, where this national security apparatus has been constructed via the Patriot Act, and the intelligence collection is now a paramount priority in the FBI versus just general law enforcement. It, the FBI is arguably now more of an intelligence agency than a law enforcement agency. Mm -hmm. And the you, this isn't recent. This is something that people on the political left have been saying for decades, that the FBI was entrapping Muslim Americans and into dom domestic terrorism plots with undercovers and with informants. And they were crimes that they were not predisposed to commit and they were doing it to justify their existence. And now, because at the time you would say that's the Bush administration, they were going after perceived terrorists from radical Islam. Well, now your administration, by his words himself, by the president of the United States, last September 1st in front of Independence Hall, he said that Republicans are anti-government extremism and white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Those are two of the top four priorities of the counterterrorism division of the FBI. So what's the, um, you know, the, the average person that you were sent, you know, to uh, investigate or talk to, to provide information back to the folks in DC, uh, what were they like? Were they white supremacists? Were they, you know, anti-government extremists? Tell us about that. Well, most of the cases had already been interviewed and investigated by the time I was reassigned. There was very little work to do, which is a whole other concern because we had these cases, they have to look active. We're waiting for marching orders that's taking years. So we would paper the file, we call it. And we would just go do unnecessary surveillance on somebody to say that we did something investigative. Is is part of the reason for that that by like keeping more people on these cases on the front end, they could justify an even higher level of of financing for the for the for the bureau on the back end because they could say Hey, it took four people, not three, to do this. And if we're going to keep doing this, we need we need the budget for four people, not three people. Or was it was, yes. was that part of the incentive? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, anytime they have the opportunity to keep cases on the books and make it look like there's an increased demand for manpower, nobody's ever going to say no to having more people available to work, more resources available. I, I think there's there's a certainly an element to that, and uh, from an administrative standpoint, the. Uh, and back to what I said with work smarter, not harder. You, you're able to keep these cases longer on the books open than you're able to check the boxes for multiple fiscal years. It, there's nothing that says, well, you have to have new case. Well, you have to have new case openings every year, but the existing cases can continue to be checking boxes for you. But back to your question on the, the, the people, the, the interviews that I conducted that were not, not very many of them, uh, but had a big impact on me. One was an anonymous tip from Rhode Island that said that a gentleman had engaged in violence on January 6th. The task force in DC did a facial recognition through his uh, social media and the surveillance cameras, negative. They did a geofence, a GPS on his phone, negative. So there was really nothing other than this anonymous tip. And, and I can tell you from being an experienced investigator, that's going to be a hard case to prosecute. Even if you go there and he confesses to committing crimes, he could be a crazy person. There's nothing, to, there's not even a complainant on this. Mm -hmm. But when I raised those concerns with the guys in my office, they said, we know, but if you don't go try to talk to him, Washington's just going to continue to tell you you have to. So I drove over to, to this gentleman's house, knocked on his door, said, I'm with the FBI, we're investigating what happened at the Capitol were you there that day? And he said, no, that was the day of my son's funeral. Now he might've been lying to me, but regardless of that, that's collateral damage that the FBI is willing to put on the ordinary citizenry, making a gentleman relive the worst day of his life, arguably, 
in order to keep this dragnet alive on these cases. And that was one incident. The second one was an actually uh, righteous, or you can argue righteous or not, but he was a subject who went to President Trump's speech. He walked over to the Capitol, went into the Capitol after asking the police for permission. We had video footage of him walking to the Capitol. He didn't commit any vandalism or any violence. He was in for a couple minutes and then left. Didn't take anything. Uh, we actually asked him if he took anything and hoping or uh, hoping or tr hoping to discover if he had maybe taken riot gear or something from the police. And he said, no, he took a free brochure. He was a dual citizen <laughs> and he wanted to have it as a keepsake for his first visit to the Capitol. This was a gentleman who was in a lawyer's office, which is not free. He had lost his job. His medical license was at risk because he had walked into the people's house. And again, this is the process becoming the punishment. We couldn't even tell him if he was going to be charged with a crime because we were not the ones who were communicating with federal prosecutors on our own cases. And that to me is a problem that exists. That is, there's a political element to it. There's a willingness on the FBI stand, standpoint to view itself as the judge, jury, and executioner to a certain extent, which is not what the FBI is supposed to do. And uh, it just was not in keeping with my oath of office, I felt, and not certainly not in keeping with my training, which I received as every FBI employee receives. And this was something that when I eventually came forward that I cited to all my levels of the chain of command, I said, look, we go to the Holocaust Memorial. We go to the MLK Memorial. It's a field trip that everybody does. And the purpose of the trip is to hammer home to all FBI employees that the Holocaust and civil rights abuses only occur when people just follow orders. When the police are willing participants, they become a political apparatchik for an out of control government. It is incumbent on you to throw the flag if you believe reasonably that we are off the rails. And I said, I, I see that. Uh, I see that from my, my point of view here with January 6th, and I see that as an extension from my involvement uh, in a small capacity with the Gretchen Whitmer case, which I was on on uh, an operational capacity as a SWAT member on the arrest on those cases. And the scale sort of fell away from my eyes in the aftermath of that case when things bore, played out in, in court, when it became pretty clear to me that those individuals were entrapped by the FBI. Uh, I went over to assist with the arrest of those those guys, got a briefing where we were told that they were just as well trained and equipped and prepared to, to engage in a fight with us, a gunfight with the FBI. And they had sophisticated encrypted communication abilities and that when we secured the structure that we were assigned to take, that we were going to have to wait and stand by and anticipate that they were going to come and start shooting at us like we were in a outpost in Afghanistan, which is not a typical briefing that you get in the FBI. It's normally just the location and the bad guy and a 30,000 foot view, but they actually had video of these guys and they described them as near peer, that they were just as, as well suited to engage in this gunfight and that we, you know, there was not a guarantee we were going to win. And, uh, and obviously that's, was not accurate. And I felt that I was sort of the wool was pulled over my eyes on that once shame on you, twice shame on me. And there's a lot of overlap with the way that the Michigan case played out and the way that we're seeing this January 6th case play out. On the eve of you deciding to come and speak forward, as you were looking around uh, in your field offices or other agents that you knew, do you get the sense that most agents agree with you? Do they not care? Are they with the nature of these political prosecutions? Paint a picture for me of what the cultural milieu inside the FBI is, especially at the agent level. Well, at the agent level, I, and I'm, I'm not in all the offices, I was in smaller offices, I felt that almost universally they shared my sentiment that what we're doing is wrong. It's certainly an outside the rules, the way we're supposed to bring forward investigations and the, the, the politics behind it. Not, not everybody's a political animal. Unfortunately, too many people are willing to just follow orders or they're worried about their own career. And most disturbing to me with the just following orders standpoint, and this is the, the second part of my, my whistleblowing because that we got into sort of the, the process issues that I had, but there was a risk to the public safety 
that I expressed. And again, I was a SWAT guy for five years. So I, I know that it's a legitimate law enforcement tool. But we were sending a large arrest operation, not SWAT, but multiple agents to go and arrest people for alleged misdemeanors. And we were sending SWAT for somebody who was a felony subject who had agreed to cooperate with us when we'd interviewed him a year and a half before. So I said, there's a huge gap in time. I think any reasonable person would think, well, they just must have declined to proceed forward. I and mean, it's been 18 months and we're sending, but we're gonna send SWAT to his house. And I could articulate a reasonable concern that we could be putting his safety in risk. We could be putting our own safety at risk. If you knock on my door, at six o'clock in the morning, and you're gonna do it very loudly if you're a SWAT team, that there's going to be a, a gun involved in that exchange because I'm coming to the door armed. I have a second amendment right. I have an obligation as a husband and a father to make sure that everything is safe in my house. And if you're coming out of nowhere to me, that I, I would make that decision. And I don't think that I'm outside the bounds of being rational on it. And you could easily to me see a situation where that guy comes to the door arms because he doesn't know what the heck's going on. And all of a sudden you hear gun, 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 bang, bang, bang. And you have a person get hurt. And I said, look, we Monday morning quarterback things like Ruby Ridge and Waco. It's Saturday. I'm here on Saturday. Game day's tomorrow. I'm telling you what you're doing is wrong. I'm telling you that we have alternative ways. The FBI should pride itself on bringing people into custody using the least amount of force necessary. We can call him on the phone. It's that simple. We can call his attorney. We can send a local deputy to knock on the door. We can do surveillance, which allegedly we're supposed to be doing on these cases. We're surveilling him, even though it was unnecessary. We know when he goes to work, where he goes to work, he stops to get gas and just swoop in and grab him then. When he's, why are we going to his house with the SWAT team? And you know, if you want to take it even a step further, what if we go to a remote location? in a rural community where there's a lot of people that are unhappy with the way the FBI is making the process the punishment. And they see a bear cat roll up on this guy's lawn, 12 agents, the operators get out of the vehicle. And then the community says, not today, not my community. And now we're in real trouble. So there's a public safety element to it too that I, I brought forward and I did that to my immediate supervisor. Um, he referred me up the chain of command to the assistant special agents in charge of my division express the same thing to them. And, uh, and then eventually to the special agent in charge of my division. So three levels of, of management. And at each level, I was told that I had a great career and a great reputation. I had actually received a, an award about six weeks before this all happened. And they said, you're jeopardizing your career because you're of your behavior here, because you're questioning. And I said, I have training, I have an oath of office. And I feel that you are asking me, you're compelling me to violate my oath of office. And it's incumbent on me to, to come forward with that. I feel like I am doing my job. I'm not refusing to do my job. I feel that I'm doing my job. And uh, they didn't share my, my sentiment and they contrived a way to work around the Whistleblower Protection Act, which Congress implemented to protect people such as myself who come forward with a reasonable concern. You don't have to be right. You just have to be reasonable, reasonable concern about waste, fraud, abuse, or risk of the public safety. And you have to come to the right authorities, your frontline supervisor being one of them. And they suspended my security clearance for other reasons and within 30 days of me coming forward. So that whistleblower process, um, I think the public doesn't really understand how it works. What were your expectations of how that might go? Um, going into it and and were those expectations met in terms of the protections that the system is theoretically supposed to afford people who are trying to inform the citizenry about wayward government institutions? I almost accidentally fell into this. I was not really coming forward in my back of my head being thinking, I'm going to become a whistleblower. I came forward to my boss who was on a first name basis with and said, look, I think what we're doing is messing up. Can I do something else that day? I'm not comfortable with it. I was willing to do my job. We had a wiretap in my office and I said, I'll sit on the wire, which is miserable. You sit there for 12 hours and wait for a phone to ring. And he said, no. And uh, I got annual training on whistleblowing. I knew that if I brought forward concerns, 
to even that frontline supervisor. That is a protected activity. You're not supposed to face retaliation. And again, you don't have to be right. It's just reasonable. And I think even to you all, I've, I've been pretty reasonable. I think that seems like a something that should be taken up. They could take up my concern and say, Steve, you're wrong. Here's why. And I would have said, okay. Or they said, Steve, you're right. We're going to correct it. And I would have said, okay. And I would have gone back to work. But instead, what they've done is they found the hack in the FBI. Because of national security, you have to have a security clearance to work in the FBI. They suspended my clearance. And once that happens, you're still employed, but you can't work in an FBI space. You can't perform the duties of an FBI agent. So you're unpaid and you sit in this purgatory where they assess your security clearance or your ability to hold one if you're a threat to national security. And in getting familiar with this process with my attorneys who have handled this through the years, they've explained to me that it's essentially a, a wait you out game because they know financially most people aren't able to wait that long. And uh, if I was in a little di different situation, I'd sort of, uh, when the, the COVID vaccine mandate came down and, and my family and I, we, we decided as a family, we weren't gonna get it, that I, I told my wife there, there might be a time that I might not be able to work for the FBI. So we, we had built up a, a reserve, a war chest to, to support her and sustain ourselves that we had. So I had a little bit longer runway than most people do. But you're unpaid, you still need their permission to work outside employment, but you can only earn up to $7,500 a year. And it's this game that they play. So, so in my case, it's, it's laughable. I, they, they said that I refused to participate in these, these arrests. Um, they actually told me not to come to work that day. They told me that I was AWOL. I was assigned to be absent without leave and doctor day's pay. So I followed orders and stayed home. They told me that I needed to participate in a security awareness briefing. And uh, when they explained to me what it was, it was sort of duplicative training that I'd already received. And I said, is this something to do with disciplinary action against me? And they said, well, you made different decisions than other people, so you're going to have to face the consequences. And that to me is pretty clear that it's disciplinary. And I, I asked if I could have an attorney. And they said, no. I said, well, can I have documentation that says I can't have an attorney that so I can take it to my attorney. And they said, okay. And then I never heard anything. I was suspended a few days later. So they told me I, I'm suspended for refusing to participate in that process, which I didn't really have a chance to do. And then finally, uh, and I will plead guilty. They, uh, I accessed improperly unclassified documents from the FBI. Uh, it was the employee handbook and guidance on disciplinary proceedings and the, uh, the quarterly reports about disciplinary matters that get put out. And I took those as a rubric for what to expect as a precedent for what I was accused of doing. And my attorney asked me to get him anything that I could find about discipline within the FBI so he would know how to represent me. And I did that. They're all unclassified. They're all housed on a classified system though. So me taking those was a violation, which probably warranted a strongly worded email, but uh, in my case, they suspended my security clearance for accessing the employee handbook improperly and walked me out of the building on September 19th of 2022. It's interesting that all of this happened at the time that it did, because not, you know, four months later, we had the creation of a committee in Congress uh, to investigate the weaponization of the federal government. Um, First, I guess, did, did you expect to become involved in commenting on, on public policy um, so soon after after you left the bureau? Um, and then second, um, what's your assessment of, of how those investigations and the public conversation on the bureau has gone so far? I was always willing to bring my information forward to them, and I did. Um, I typed up and submitted a formal whistleblower declaration and gave it to Congressman Jordan's office, to Senator Durbin's office, to Senator Grassley's office. So I was always willing to, to communicate with them. And then when the midterm elections happened and power changed over in the House to the Republicans, then they, they formed this weaponization committee. Uh, I was hopeful that I'd be able to be an active participant in that. I felt that I had information, not just pertaining to this January 6th concerns that I had, but there's all this other information that uh, I'd had experience with, and I felt that I could be helpful to them in that. Um, I did the transcribed interview, uh, and I viewed that as almost a 
in a uh, rehearsal for a, like a Broadway show. That's the point where you're learning the information. There's not supposed to be anything bombshell revealed to the Congress people during a hearing. So when I eventually went to the hearing, that to me is the opportunity. It's show night. We're going to make the presentation to the American people about what we know so that, that we can generate a grassroots appetite for actual reform. And I don't think I've seen, I didn't see that in my hearing. I didn't see that in the recent hearing with, involving the IRS whistleblowers. And that wasn't the weaponization committee, but it's par for the course with so many of these congressional hearings. I think they miss out on opportunities to, to do it the right way to actually get the information out to the American people. Because like I said, it's, it's a show at that point. They're not learning anything new. Unfortunately though, it's, it's an opportunity for them to monologue in front of a camera for a few minutes. And they're very disjointed in that. I think that the right strategy would be whenever the majority has an opportunity to question a witness, we're going to give our time to one person and they will do a direct examination of the witnesses to allow the witnesses to share the information. They had a golden opportunity with those IRS whistleblowers, with myself and with Garrett O'Boyle, not just because of the information we had, but because of the experience, work experience that we have with testifying. I've testified hundreds of times. The, that environment is not as intimidating to me as it would be a, another person that sits there because I faced direct and examination, cross-examination from a hostile defense attorney, testifying in front of a grand jury. Because I have that familiarity, I, I was willing and prepared to share the information that I had. And you look to those IRS whistleblowers, they had laptops, they had documents, binders full. They were ready to share that information. And because that temptation exists for them to, to the members of the committees to, to get their couple minutes on screen, they're just not productive with that time. And the minority of the Democrats run the clock out. They monologue themselves and um, and then just rip the, the witnesses for the full amount of time and don't give them the opportunity to respond. Or if they do respond, it cuts in on the Republicans' time where they're supposed to be actually examining the information. And it's just not a productive process. Do you know how many people like actually watched any of those hearings? Like I, like I, remember reading about uh, the Un-American Affairs Activity Committee, uh, Activities Committee, uh, they had like a lot of those hearings. It was like 10 million people a night, you know, were, were watching those. Do you have any inclination as to how many? I, I've been surprised that a number of people have told me that they've watched it, but they were, they're more activists, people that, that I've talked to. Um, I can tell you that most people in the FBI didn't know it happened, which mm. is pretty disturbing when you have actual whistleblowers coming forward to Congress um, when my queries went back to the offices, they said, what happened? We, no, we didn't have it on TV. No, we don't know. Um, and again, that's, that's a failure to gin up the interest in it. And it's a failure in, in the presentation because what happens is the people that do tune in and might have a genuine curiosity or interest in it, they just see politicians arguing with each other and they say, it's the same thing. I'm changing the channel, even if they have a genuine interest in it. And I think that that's that's a failure on, on any sort of congressional hearing. Have any Democrats been receptive to your message um, and the reforms that you're calling for? A few journalists have. Uh, Matt Taibbi uh, was, I think, has made no secret about the fact that he's kind of he's been a Democrat voter, and he came and, and heard my story out and then wrote a, a nice, uh, I felt very fair and balanced piece about it. Um, Michael Schellenberger has as well. And I recently did an interview with, uh, with the individual from the New Yorker, but no representatives have given me the, the time or, or, uh, the ear to, to, to share with them my concerns. And un it's unfortunate because you, you take what I'd said before about the, for years, members of the left have been saying that the FBI was targeting vulnerable Muslim Americans. And I think too many people on the conservative side just said, no, that's not happening. I said, well, not, they can take the W on this one. You have some actual agreement here. We might not agree on the motivations behind why it's happening, but we, we can certainly agree on that it is. Uh, but unfortunately, I think there's too much tribalism. So it's very clear based on your witness and the experiences you've had that there are deep structural problems with the FBI, the financial incentives alone that 
the agency has in order to pursue certain lines of inquiry. What are the structural reforms that we need to do to the FBI to get it to stop behaving this way? If I was a dictator for a day, the FBI would be broken into a thousand pieces and scattered to the wind. And that I'm hardly an impartial person on that. So I think you have to be pragmatic with it. But I think recently we saw the, the shooting in Utah and the questions that went over that are revealing the problems that exist with the trust the American people have with the FBI. Probably it was a righteous shoot, but I know there's a large swath of citizens that say, I don't trust anything the FBI says at this point. Mm. So there needs to be major reforms. It cannot just be a change at headship of the director's office. I've proffered, I, I believe, something that's fair and I would be willing to give a try to, and that would be to return the FBI to its origin of being an unarmed investigative agency. You could today, through appropriations, the House Republicans could eliminate the 1811 criminal investigator, the special agent position from the FBI. Let's eliminate the, the guns and then make them unarmed investigators. There's already a position that exists. It's an 1810. They're typically more administrative, regulatory investigators, but we could maybe expand their responsibilities. And then through appropriations, force the FBI to get the permission of a local agency that has jurisdiction in the area that they want to conduct an investigation. And then use the task force officers, like the ones that were on my joint terrorism task force. We could expand that effort. We could federally deputize more detectives at sheriff's offices and police offices, make them both state and federal law enforcement officers, have them assist in those investigations. Those guys have the local knowledge, they have the experience, they didn't just go to Quantico for 20 weeks. Before that, they were a real estate agent or something. These guys are experienced cops and becoming a task force officer is something that you earn by showing, demonstrating your abilities. They would assist the FBI in those investigations. And then when it comes time to affect an arrest, if it's warranted, again, get the permission of the local sheriff and the task force officers who work for that agency would execute that arrest. And that creates the bulwark, I believe, against a weaponized, politicized FBI because a sheriff who's more accountable to his constituents can stand in the gap between them and the FBI and say, you're not going to arrest my citizen here. I don't concur with that. And I, I make it a comparison to the way we used to elect senators or select senators in the country before the 17th Amendment. They came from the state houses. And there was a way for the states to give the federal government the personnel and made them more responsive to the needs of the states. Here we can do that. We can make the FBI more accountable to the local needs of the police and the sheriff's offices because they're really going to sign off on what their needs are. It's not going to be a quota system that comes from Washington, D.C., from a bureaucrat at the J. Edgar Hoover building. It's going to be a deputy or a chief deputy or a sheriff who's going to say, look, here are my problems that I want to address to my communities. And these are the only sort of crimes that I'm going to sign off on and authorize you to investigate. Are there any reasons to believe that certain national cases that are very complex, um, that involve many states, many jurisdictions, would be harder to solve if that system were implemented? I don't think so. I, I think the, the task force officers are more than equipped. They're experienced investigators. Uh, they mo Many times in my career that I've worked with them, they were the superior law enforcement professional in, in the actual room. So I think we need to give the, the, the cops their due the FBI is not the magical police. And this, this bore itself out to me most with the, the Brett Kavanaugh investigation. They said, the FBI needs to investigate this alleged sexual assault that happened decades ago. And I remember thinking <laughs> like, we don't have that ability. That's not even a federal crime. But secondly, we're just now we're going to find the DNA evidence because the FBI is involved. That's not true. The FBI is mostly nerds in cubicles. The actual cops are the guys that know how to do investigations. And and I'm, I'm not arguing for defunding police. I'm arguing for empowering the agencies and the local police that have the skill set, if not necessarily the resources to bring those investigations forward. One of the things that's happening with law enforcement across the board, and frankly, many typically more masculine um, 
high difficulty positions is that there's a recruitment crisis. You know, people don't want to become cops anymore because they see that there is enormous social stigma associated with doing so. Is a similar thing happening in the FBI or is recruitment as good as it's always been because it's the most prestigious thing to do? And if you're not getting, you know, folks like yourself with a law enforcement background, you're at least getting the kind of Pete Buttigieg's of the world who want, uh, you know, a nice sinecure in, in DC. What's the situation with, with that pipeline? There's definitely a purge going on through the application and hiring process where they're getting people that are more aligned with their political worldview. Uh, from what I understand with the new agents coming in and the, the way that they've lowered standards or, or augmented the standards, Christopher Ray testified that despite the public disapproval of his agency, the fact that they have a record number of applicants is grounds for giving himself a pat on the back that the FBI is just fine. And I've just compared that to a restaurant or who his customers come to him and say, every time I eat your food, I get food poisoning. Christopher Ray's customers are the American people. And he's saying, well, I have a record number of people who want to be waiters, so we're doing just fine. <laughs> and, and that's just not logical. And I, I think you just have to look at the, the proof is in the pudding here for, <laughs> for uh, no pun intended. The, uh, the FBI is not doing the work that I think that the, F, that the public at large expects it to do criminal investigations. It's getting roped into these intelligence investigations. It's getting uh, roped into the, the politics of choosing its targets. And there needs to be major reform. I, I think that my idea has some merit. I, I, I would encourage the, the Republicans who actually do have the power to implement it to, to look into that seriously. There's so much more that we could talk about here, but our time is limited. Where can people keep up with everything that you're writing and saying about this? Um, and how can they reach out if, you know, people with influence or people on the Hill want to um, make sure that their bosses hear more about what you have to say? I'm a fellow at Center for Renewing America, which you can uh, access everything that's going on there. They're they're pushing back on woke and weaponized government, americarenewing.com. I'm on social media. My Twitter profile is at real Steve friend. And I also have a, a personal memoir that's available out now uh, on Amazon. Barnes and Noble. It's called True Blue, My Journey from Beat Cop to Suspended FBI Whistleblower. The FBI wanted a lot of it redacted. I refuse to do that. And I think it, it goes into the, the whistleblowing experience and the information that I brought forward in greater detail that you don't necessarily get from a three-minute cable news hit. And uh, and you can find out really what, what that experience was like for me over the last, uh, over the last year. Steve, thank you so much for stepping forward. Um, not enough people do it, and the people who do deserve enormous credit. And thank you for being in the fight here in DC. Thank you for having me. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. And if you're on the Hill and your boss is at all interested in or talks on the internet about woke and weaponized government, be sure to reach out to Steve. If you need any help doing that, feel free to reach out to us. Please be sure, as always, to rate and review this podcast, Five Stars, on Apple or Spotify. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube. You can see our beautiful mugs, or uh, in this case, we were noticing earlier, Steve's like perfect teeth. Apparently, he had <laughs> braces when he was a kid, and uh, they worked. <laughs> uh, uh, we we post uh, the full show and, and chop it up into 10 to 12-minute bite-sized segments as well. Thank Jake for doing that. So be sure to subscribe on YouTube as well as on the podcast feeds. And... Uh, follow us on X, I guess now it's, uh, it's X.com. We are at AM moment org. I am S Sharma us. Nick is Nick S Solheim. Uh, just go find American moment, saturate every waking moment of your day with American moment content. So we'll be a happier and better person for it. We will see you guys next week. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.